it is. <laughs> We're going to talk about something, and really I'm here to help because I helped with a project that Jennifer spearheaded, um, but I want to tell you this is all her baby. This is some of Jennifer's brilliance, and that is if we're really going to do culture change, we're talking about changing all kinds of things. We haven't really talked about education very much, so we're going to talk about something you probably won't hear at other conferences because this is really another radical idea, so thank you to Jennifer, and we have Kyrie Carpenter who's going to be helping us out a little bit too in the back. Kyrie, I met in San Francisco working for Age Song. Uh, she was an intern there, but is now in uh, Milwaukee, is it? Yes, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and bringing great things to the great state of Wisconsin. So glad to be here. What we'd like to do for starters is um, to start with a fable. A little story to kick things off. You know how Eden is, we love stories. And um, that's not the fable. So I would like you to just sort of uh, put yourself in a quiet place. You can close your eyes if you want. Uh, and we're going to just have you visualize the story, uh, the fable of upstream and downstream. These are two towns. It was many years ago that villagers in downstream recall spotting the first body in the river. Some old timers remember how Spartan were the facilities and procedures for managing that sort of thing. Sometimes they say it would take hours to pull 10 people from the river. And even then, only a few would survive. Though the number of victims in the river has increased greatly in recent years, the good folks of downstream have responded admirably to the challenge. Their rescue system is clearly second to none. Most people discovered in the swirling waters are reached within 20 minutes, many in less than 10. Only a small number drown each day before help arrives, a big improvement from the way it used to be. Talk to the people of downstream and they'll speak with pride about the new hospitals by the edge of the water, the flotilla of rescue boats ready for service at a moment's notice, the comprehensive health plans for coordinating all the manpower involved, and the large number of highly trained and dedicated swimmers always ready to risk their lives to save victims from the raging currents. Sure, it costs a lot, but, say the downstreamers, what else can decent people do except to provide whatever is necessary when human lives are at stake? Oh, a few people in downstream have raised the question now and again, but most folks show little interest in what's happening upstream. It seems there's so much to do to help those in the river that nobody's got time to check on how those bodies are getting there in the first place. That's just the way things are sometimes. So that's our little fable to start things. What do you glean from that story? Would anyone like to share their thinking about that story? Don't be shy. Yes, thank you. Somebody should go upstream and see what's going on. So what people are doing is they are reacting to something they see, and they're doing it better and better every year in a more and more efficient manner, but they haven't got to the root cause, have they? They're just kind of downstream. They're reacting to something, but no one has solved the problem of how the bodies got in the river in the first place. Any other thoughts about what this says? Placing the urgent before the important. So once again, responding to crises, responding to the needs of the moment, which is important, but not looking at the bigger picture, right? Uh, what causes the urgency? Great. Yes. I'll start here and go. Yeah. Taking a pride in what you're... When, taking a pride in doing the wrong thing. <laughs> okay. Taking a pride in doing the wrong thing, or maybe doing the right thing, but just not going far enough. Okay. Beautiful. And hope you had another... It's a Band-Aid. It's a Band-Aid. What, what do you think of when, in the, in the context of the Eden Halter of an elder care, what does this fable say to you about us and our systems of care and how we look after our elders? Stuck in the system. Stuck in the system. Reactionary. Very reactionary, not proactive. We're not upstream. We're not preventing. We're responding and treating. Good. Other thoughts? The bodies are increasing more and more in recent years. What does that remind you of, those demographics? <laughs> Aging or maybe dementia, they're both rising rapidly. Let's see the way you look. Um, so uh, we're seeing more and more bodies and we're getting better and better at efficiently managing them. That might be the term I'd use, but maybe not really getting to what we need. Any other thoughts about this story? Okay, well, um, there's a reason why we start with this story, 
and let me just get on to the next. We're going to talk about the pathway to living well upstream, and we're going to talk about particularly how we might educate people, and we're going to take you through some of that during the next couple hours, and I will mention that um, we will, it's a two-hour, two 45-minute schedule, we are going to take a uh, break, uh, so um, there's somewhere in the middle, we'll take a little 15-minute break too, uh, just so you can stretch, do the bio breaks, all that. But if you need to move around, go outside for a second, don't worry about that. Just come and go. Also, stop us. Ask questions when you need, when you want. We're going to have some targeted discussions and interaction, but don't wait. If you've got something you want to say, please jump in, because this, we want this to be very uh, dialogical, I guess would be the word that Jennifer would say, because that's what this is all about. So the pathway living upstream, living upstream, how we see the world and relate. So we're going to talk about dementia, and we're going to talk about how we can live well upstream in supporting people who live with a diagnosis of dementia. So viewing dementia from a social relational view, not just a biomedical paradigm. The second pathway, how to make decisions with, instead of just for, persons living with dementia. The third pathway, focusing on well-being versus interventions and discrete programs. Well-being upstream, interventions downstream. Fourth pathway is learning upstream, to engage in dialogue versus traditional education. And the last one is leading upstream, working in collaborative teams versus top-down silos. So you can see where education, reframing dementia, and culture change, organizational change, yes, all go together. Thank you, Becky. Becky's our lifesaver. We want a little guitar, and Becky was able to go get it for us. Thank you so much. So great. Thank you, Becky Perez and, uh, and <laughs> Teresa from AIPP. You guys are the best. It'll sound even worse when I play it. Thanks. I'm way out of shape. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and get it in some semblance of tune, and Jennifer is going to take over and talk a little bit about um, the first pathway. I'll give you this. Thank you. Um, Hi. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. So today we want to explore these pathways with you. And um, when I say explore, I, I really mean explore and hear your ideas, um, your experiences. Most of the content today will be provided by all of you as we engage in a very active exploration of these pathways toward upstream and well-being. And, and so this is going to be a pretty interactive couple of hours. And, um, and the first thing that we want to do is share um, an experience with you that will help us explore this first pathway. The pathway of um, really viewing dementia through a social relational lens instead of a biomedical or institutional lens. And to help us explore this pathway, to set up our first uh, dialogue, I'm going to invite Curie to come up and join me. We want to share some quotes with you um, that are from elders who are living with dementia. And as they share with us their experiences with these two different views of dementia and the experiences that these two different views create. As you hear these quotes, um, and they are all quotes, I promise you we haven't doctored any of them. Um, some come from my research, some come from Curie's experiences working with elders, some are published firsthand accounts, but they're all the words of elders, and some of them might burn. <laughs> some of them might sting as we listen to their words. And, um, and here's the, the sad truth Bartlett and O'Connor wrote about in their book, broadening the dementia debate that a lot of oppressive and discriminatory practices have their foothold in the well-meaning, well-intentioned ideas of those least intending to do harm, right? And I think, Al, your presentation gave us all an experience with ideas that can burn or sting as we all reflect on our own practices. And I'd like to talk about my five-year plan of forgiveness. And that's this understanding that there are things I'm doing today that five years from now I'm going to look back on and cringe, right? And for me, I've worked in the field um, of long-term care and retirement living for almost 30 years now. And over those 30 years, that has been the only constant, <laughs> is that I keep learning new things. And I have to change my practices. And so 
I get it. I have to be compassionate with myself that there are things I'm doing today that in the future, now that I know better, I will do better, right? So as you listen to these quotes, um, all this to say, if something burns or stings, that's a real learning opportunity, I believe. And so I'll encourage all of you to embrace it. And, uh, and um, so without further ado, let's, um, we would like to share the words of, our, of elders who are living with dementia to set up a group discussion. As you listen to these words, we'll ask you to consider these two questions. What words would you use to describe how these individuals are feeling? So what are the themes that you're hearing? What words would you use to describe their experiences? What experiences are they expressing? What are they showing us? What are they telling us? And um, as we read, um, Al will back us up with a little bit of, of music here. This is like reader's theater. <laughs> They think I can't do anything. Until they get used to me and what I can still do, many just try to take over. They also give meaningless activities like tip all of the pens and pencils out on the table and then mix them up and then ask us to sort them out. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it made me angry. One care worker accused me of lying when I talked about being involved on a consumer committee because she said, if I had dementia, I couldn't do that. They don't take the time to know my own personal interests. They want to herd me into group activities that are simple, cheap, require no individualized contact. It pisses me off. It demeans me. They introduce childlike activities that put us all in one category. When I came down with Alzheimer's, my friends weren't my friends anymore. They don't come and talk to me or just to be with me. Like, I guess they're frightened that they're going to catch the same thing. I don't want to be here. It's not living to me. When we got together, together, and that's the next time, we have to say what we will do. Not really, because we're not doing things. Would they kick you out if they saw you? I don't know. We both go. Or where can I get myself? I don't want to be bringing you up and down. I could do that, you know. I could go. You could put me up with the regulars. I'd be OK. People didn't know how to talk to me, even though I was the same person I was five minutes before I told them that I had it. They just saw this big A on my forehead. They didn't look at me as the same person. I was suddenly stupid or couldn't carry on a conversation or have a single thought on my own which was very distressing to me. Many think it's the disease that causes us to withdraw, and to some extent, I believe this is true. But for many of us, we withdraw because we are not provided with meaningful opportunities that allow us to continue to experience joy, purpose, engagement in life. I live with the imminent dread that one mistake in my daily life will mean another freedom is taken from me. We are, I believe, disabled as a consequence of the misconceptions of dementia and the fears these misconceptions create. Often, what I see is loving, well-meaning care partners who almost completely disable and disempower their partner with dementia. 
I feel sure, though, it's not their fault, but rather that they have been set up to do this by the prescribed disengagement dished out to us all. These are the words of our elders. We'd like to ask you at your tables to please introduce yourselves, um, build community, and then to reflect on these words of our elders who are living with dementia, and to tell us what words you would use to describe how these people are feeling. What experiences are they expressing? So we're just going to take about five minutes so that you can meet one another and then come up with a couple of themes and then we're going to ask for some volunteers to share what their table has come up with, okay? All Jennifer right. is our roving microphone person. I'll stay up front too. Um, so uh, let's start with this first question. What words come to your mind when you heard those expressions from people living with dementia? What are some of the ways that describe to you how those people are feeling? Ostracized. Ostracized. So there's really, it's more than just being isolated. It's actually being kind of almost willfully um, attacked in ways. Incarcerated. Incarcerated. Okay. Fear. Fear. Prisoners. Prisoners. I personally believe, this is something, this is another topic, but I personally believe that the CMS definition of restraint, a device adjacent to a residence body that prevents freedom of movement, locked doors are restraints. <laughs> and if you had to target your QIs by how many locked doors you have, we wouldn't look so good probably. But anyway, yeah, so prisoners, what else? Okay, beautiful. That's just what I was about to put my mouth to say. Thank you, Hope. So restraints are more than physical restraints. When you are isolated, when people don't take the time to communicate well with you, they actually are disempowering you and isolating you from the rest of society. Yeah. What other words have you thought of? Diminished. Diminished, Purcell says. Great. Frustration. Frustration. Stagnation. Stagnation. You can't grow. You can't grow. We, you know, Eden, <laughs> Eden's all about growth. One of our core beliefs is that as long, you can't separate human life from human growth. And uh, this is what happens too often to people with that label, what Kate Swaffer called her prescribed disengagement that she got from the medical profession, who told her to don't do anything exciting, go home, get your affairs in order, drop out of life because you're dying. Eight years ago before her two bachelor's and master's degree. <laughs> And then they give her pens and pencils to sort out yeah, after yeah, all that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to give you the mic. Oh, um, Cherry Joe was bringing to light that we kind of are so consumed with the concept of safety. We got to keep them safe. We got to keep them safe. We got to keep them safe. Well, I've had the opportunity to work with individuals that have been labeled with dementia with behaviors and significant behaviors, aggressive behaviors, where they're almost dual diagnosis. They think, oh my gosh, was there a pre-mental health that we didn't recognize prior to the dementia? And it basically what, what we've done is these individuals have expressed to me they feel like caged animals. So in essence, we've actually created a very unsafe environment by our practices, and our behaviors are shooting through the roof, exposing all vulnerability. And instead of just sitting back and being with the individual and reducing those behaviors, um, meeting them where they're at. Thanks, Hope. Sure. Uh, you know, we talked about how sometimes our view of dementia pathologizes normal behavior. Think about yourself just doing an experiment, moving into one of these places with a lock that you cannot open. How long would you last? <laughs> I might make it a day. I might. So is it really dementia that makes you climb the walls when you can't get out, get fresh air, stretch your legs? Great, great point. Um, what else? Other thoughts? Should we go to the other question? What, experience, what other experiences? We've talked about some, the idea of incarceration, of diminishment, um, of fear. What other experiences are you hearing? Boredom. Yeah. Significant boredom for some people. Learned helplessness. And not only boredom, but once again, just as you said, you can be restrained without restraints, you can be bored with things to do. When it's things that are meaningless to you, uh, like sorting pencils. Yeah. And by the way, 
five-year plan of forgiveness, right? <laughs> I may not have sorted pencils in my career, but I have given all other manner of meaningless activities that were purposeful full, right? To help people have a sense of purpose. But what elders are saying is they want actual purpose. And I love the story you tell, Al, about the laundry. Can you share uh, yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> Dr. Richard Taylor, my great late friend who passed away last year from cancer, lived with Alzheimer's for a dozen years. And uh, one of my favorite stories of Richard's was that he was visiting people in a care community uh, where he had been giving a talk. And he went to a place that would be described as a, as a separate living area for people with dementia and saw two women who would be described as having moderately advanced dementia. And they were sitting at a desk and they had a pile of children's clothes and they were folding them and sticking them in the laundry basket. And so he introduced himself, talked to them for a few minutes, and then he asked them, so tell me, what are you doing here? Do these clothes belong to children of staff or do you have a daycare? And one of the women looked at him, she said, there are no children here bless you. And then he said, oh, okay, are these maybe donations for the poor? And she turned to her friend and she said, should we tell him? And her friend said, go ahead. She said, there are no children here. They bring us a pile of clothes and we fold them, put them in the basket. Then they take them somewhere and they mess them up and bring them back and we fold them again. And Richard, of course, had a shocked expression on his face. And the other woman looked at him. She said, yeah, but it's better than a stick in the eye. And he said, can't we give people something to do that's more than just better than a stick in the eye? Is that really good enough? Right. And I hate to say, I believe that that practice in different forms is very prevalent in the field. And the elders are calling us to do better. It doesn't take that much more creative thinking to take it the next step yeah. from a sense of purpose to actual purpose. Yeah. Right? I always say, get rid of the word feel. We always say we want to give something to do to help them feel useful, make it to help them be useful. And as Jennifer says, there's almost, it takes some thinking, but there's almost always some level at which somebody can do something. If those women had been folding napkins to set the table for a meal, it would have been an entirely different thing than folding the clothes that got messed up. Purcell, yeah, I'm just going to bring the mic. When you gave that specific um, example as you were reading through of the pencils and the pens, I, I just cringed and I wrote down canned approaches, canned approaches. And they have the best of intentions. Absolutely. But someone hears things like sorting pencils and pens and folding laundry and they detach the meaning from it. And then it becomes a check off. Right. And that's when it goes down that path. That's when the doom loop begins because what Al just described is a meaningful activity in setting a table and engaging in convivium with others. But just the full clothes for children and no children are there, they get it. They get it. I followed a presentation quite a while back of somebody who was uh, running a day program for people in the community who talked about the, just one constant string of activities, canned activities after another. And her comment was, we want to keep busy, people so busy and so active that they'll just home, go home and they'll go right to sleep when they get back home. And um, I had to follow that talk, which was very interesting. There's two more <laughs> comments over oh, here. Oh, OK. Let Sorry. me run. <laughs> then we'll change our tune. We're going to change the tune. <laughs> That's okay. We, got, we have video, so I want to make sure the people on the camera, because they're going to be on YouTube. Yeah. So, In uh, our facility, what we do with our all-timer, I used to be an activity director, but I'm not now. <laughs> but what we used to do, we let them decide what they want to do. Like, we got a lot of them that plants garden. We even let them plant their own garden. Yeah. A lot of them remember planting garden. A lot of them remember folding clothes. But when you got them doing something active with their mind, they're not violent at all. They're just like normal people. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to make them understand. I mean, you got to treat them like they're adults. A lot of people treat all the time as like they're kids, and they're not. They're not yeah. children. Yeah. They're grown people, That's right. and they do have a man. Mm -hmm. It might not be all the way there, but when you treat them with respect, mm -hmm. you don't have any problems. <laughs> Can it's I come all live in your about home? the respect. <laughs> I want to come live in your home. <laughs> Thank you so much. We've even gone as far as that we've had um, staff members who've had babies. They've brought the babies in and they've let the elders wash their babies. And it's amazing. They do not lose that control. They know exactly what to do. It doesn't matter what level of dementia. That's right. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much. Yeah. 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 Um, 
Going back to what the gentleman was saying earlier, I think what has happened is the silo effect and that task orientation instead of that conceptualization and connectiveness. So, you know, we don't know how to connect what this activity is going to lead to this activity and what's going to lead to this activity. And so, and that's part of growth, right? So it's also about helping the staff recognize what their daily rhythm is and what it connects in their life so that they can then bring that to the table and work with the individuals that they're serving. This is why I've continued to time my work with people with dementia with Eden, because the people that give you pencils to sort or laundry to fold are not bad people. They're working in a system that puts preference on tasks, on keeping people occupied so they don't disturb you when you're trying to pass pills or do whatever, is, whatever the task is that you've been assigned. We have to change the system. People, the people are good. We have to give them a system where they can really express themselves. So let's go back to some other quotes. Good people just working downstream, right? That's right, <laughs> downstream. So we want to share some quotes with you, again, from our elders who are living with dementia that will give us some tips <laughs> and <laughs> about how we can get upstream. How do we get upstream? And they're going to share with us um, their experiences when care partners are working from more of that social relational view of dementia instead of the more limited biomedical or institutional view. And so uh, we're ready to turn a page here and to consider some possibilities and opportunities. Without my involvement in the process, others can't find a new sense of purpose that fits for me. And what they begin to substitute then is activities. <laughs> we need to work on this task together. We need to be creative together. We need to identify the elements of what I like to do, what makes me smile and feel good about myself, what is meaningful to me, what kind of tasks must be collected or invented to meet my new sense of purpose. I can grow. I can learn. I can contribute. Hey, John, how was music? Oh, music? Did I go to music? You know, the ladies from activities told me you did, but I could be mistaken. Well, hold on, hold on just a second. Let me see. I feel really good. I must have gone to music. Adopting a soul identity as our caregiver highlights our illness and strips us both of other identities. We have become caregiver and sufferer in a relationship of codependence. At the same time, if we adopt an identity as a sufferer of our illness, we learn helplessness. We lose more function and show an excess disability. This will only add to your own burdens as our caregiver and exacerbate the problem for both of us. We need to move away from labeling ourselves caregiver and sufferer toward becoming a care partnership in which we accept, collaborate, and adapt to new roles within the journey of dementia. And in this care partnership, the person with dementia is at the center of the relationship for sure, but not alone as an object to be looked at as a mere care recipient. Oh no, instead we become an active partner in a circle of care. Support groups are a very important way for us to deal with all of this, managing our lives daily. On the days I'm going to my support group, regardless of how much fog, funk, physical thud I feel in the morning, not only do the support groups get me going in the morning, I'm usually very charged up all day. I don't know you here, but I know you here. I want others to know and treat us as if we are whole people. We are not half full or half empty. We will never, ever be a shell of ourselves. Later in the disease, you may knock on my door, and I may not answer.
but that does not mean I'm not home. I am still wholly and fully a human being. I have a right to privacy, dignity, respect, and I am still able, I believe perhaps in ways you cannot appreciate because you do not have dementia. I am still able to appreciate myself, to love and need to feel loved. I am in short, no different than you, except I have dementia. Many assume that due to the diagnosis that I'm unable to do anything constructive or creative. <laughs> but I feel like I will show you. <laughs> Consequently, I advocate for all of us to teach anyone who will listen that we deserve respect and dignity. By casting aside the lie of dementia that we're losing our selfhood, we can work towards creating a new future. If we communicate, we can educate the public. We can educate our families. It's really, really important that we all talk about this so there's not this big stigma about Alzheimer's disease. I am more than my mistakes, and I have learned I'm forever changing. I'm changing in different ways now, and I have more to give now. The wisdom of the elders, and they are showing us and telling us how you can live well with dementia, right? So what are they teaching us? Again, we're just going to ask you to get back into your small groups there and to entertain those two questions. What words would you use to describe how these people are feeling? And what experiences are they expressing? How are their experiences different from the ones that we heard previously? So it'll just take five minutes to do that. And again, we'll ask for some volunteers to share. We'll take just one more minute. Okie dokie. Once again, we will uh, try to use the mics. Because uh, we are doing some recording and we don't have camera mics, so uh, this will help make it clear for anyone who wants to watch this after the fact. There's so many good sessions that people are going to be watching parallel sessions later. So who would like to talk about what they heard this time? A different set of experiences or feelings? Okay, Patrick. What I was... What I was just sharing with the group here is while it wasn't said verbatim, I don't think in any of the comments, a lot of what I heard, especially initially from people living with dementia in, in their words, was them essentially saying that you need me. I mean, you need me to do everything you want to do. Without me, you don't know what person you're directing, you're, you're allowing to direct their own care, or what person you're centering care around. I am the person. It is about me, and without my voice, you're nothing. I mean, that's very powerful yeah. to me. That's a really, so that's really, that's agency. That is people expressing agency. And that's so important. And that's what Ruth Bartlett and Deborah O'Connor talk about this. It's more than just care. It's about social citizenship. It's about agency. It's about uh, leisure enjoyment. It's about uh, engagement with the arts. There's so much more to life than just care in the traditional sense. <laughs> Um, what we got out of it, some of this was that there was hope, the way they were talking, that if, you know, the hope is if they look at me and listen to me, I might get what I deserve and what I really need. Great. There's hope. What else? And I think, uh, sorry, this might be a kind of a longish answer, uh, but what I found was when you hear this, it's something that you connect with. That there's this enduring element of, of a person that you can um, you can be with, and when I did my Eden Associate training, I thought it was fabulous to hear the difference between a visitor and a companion. Uh, you know, a visitor is something you just drop in on. It's like, hey, how you doing? Nope, you can't do that. Or, yep, you can do that. Whereas a companion, you have a shared horizon. Um, 
and if I can share a story, I hope that it's okay. Please do. One of my favorite memories from early, from when I was 20 was I had this really crappy manual labor job, and I worked with a bunch of other dummies about the same age. And my favorite memories were we would drive around in this, in this truck, and what caught me is that we're all sitting side by side, and we all had this shared horizon. We all would, we weren't really focusing on each other as, you know, uh, unless we did something stupid, which was often, but... Uh, but no, we had this shared horizon, and we were all focused on the same thing, on the same objective, which is to go do the work, get a coffee, and go home as quick as we could. And what I hear from this is there is a possibility of when you catch on to something, there's a, from what someone says and who they are and what they want, a possibility of creating that shared horizon. And if I can give an example of something that I'd really like to do, uh, a resident at, my, at the place where I work, uh, she really wants to go visit her boyfriend and there's a lot of barriers in the way and it would be very easy to say no honey I'm sorry you can't do that you, how are you gonna get to the bathroom when you get your boyfriends how are you even gonna get there we can't get you in the car but it'd be a very different story to say okay so you want to try it let's try it together so let's set up and go to physio and then you encounter those errors together and then you problem solve together and that's a relationship yeah so. beautiful thank you for sharing that's great other comments Bob? Oh, yes. Um, I felt that they were saying, look, I know stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Margaret puts it short and sweet. I know stuff. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, Chris. It just struck me as being more strength-based perspective, you know, as opposed to the earlier quotes were more deficit-based. So one of the things we talked about was giving purpose, but how do we find out what that purpose is? And so being in this industry for a very long time and asking for that forgiveness, I think one of the things that we fail to do is to really understand that person. So we will ask you when you get dementia, do you have a living will? Do you have five wishes? But we never ask you what brings you purpose. Right? For me, I have an only child who's gone away to college for the next 12 years to be a doctor. Right. I don't want him telling somebody what gives me purpose, right? So I vow that I am going to write my care plan before I get to mention what purpose is for me, right? And so I would like to see as an industry, when we start diagnosing people before they can tell us anymore, that we start that care plan then, right? Yeah, and really important to talk about that holistic approach. I, I just got to chair a panel on end-of-life decisions at Alzheimer's Disease International a, a week and a half ago, and um, one of the people on the panel was this wonderful lady, Edie Mayhew, who lives in Australia, who lives with uh, dementia with her partner, and she read uh, a, a, a sort of a, a two-page um, summary of what she wanted out of life and what she wanted out of the rest of her life. And she talked about things like, you know, I want to pass away in my bedroom in my home where I can hear the birds singing outside the window and I can see them on the feeder. And I want to be able to smell this or taste this or know this. And, you know, when you check those boxes that say DNR, no feeding tube, you really, that's important, but you don't get to these other things. And it's really about every single choice. And that's a great point is bring these up, bring them up with everybody. Bring them up with your loved ones. Talk about them today so that you know. One of the hardest things I've seen as a doctor is family members having to make end-of-life decisions. Even if they know what the, per- what the person would have wanted, if the person didn't tell them, they still feel an incredible burden. I can't tell you how many people I've seen sign that DNR and say the words, I feel like I'm signing her death certificate. Uh, because they were not told exactly what the person wanted. And uh, so that, that's a really great point. Thanks. Thank you for sharing uh, your stories and your wisdom. I, and like I said, the, all, all of us together will be populating the content um, of this session. And so I really appreciate your active engagement and sharing so much of yourselves already. And uh, to, to help demonstrate the power of, the, of collective wisdom, um, there is uh, a table that looks like this on your handout, and, um, which describes differences between a biomedical view and a social or relational view of dementia. And um, we put that in there just as a handy uh, resource for all of you, but um, we already heard from your comments. Uh, you've already highlighted everything on this table. <laughs> And and so thank you for that. Um, so there are differences, and the view 
the, um, the manner in which we view dementia influences the opportunities that are then provided to people who are living with dementia. And, and so when we're talking about how do we support well-being, um, I think it's really important that, that we, take a, we have a view of dementia that opens up a space for those opportunities. If you look on that table at the very bottom, um, through, through that biomedical view, uh, people tend to see people who are living with dementia as suffering and, and fading away in the long goodbye. And we're not saying that suffering doesn't exist. Um, we know that there is suffering within the context of changing cognition. There's suffering in life, right? Suffering is a part of life. But if you only view people living with dementia as fading away, as the long goodbye, as sufferers, what opportunities do we open for them? So it's really important to remember that people who are living with dementia can continue to learn and grow. They can learn and grow. And, um, and so it's important that we continue finding opportunities for people to live into that space. And uh, with learning, sometimes uh, takes it, there's risk involved, right? And I love, Al, you share that story. Another story I love so much in your book is about an elder who said, I want to do something important, and, and, and I want it to be something that if it doesn't go... If I he, screwed up, something bad happens. <laughs> if, if I screwed up, something bad happens. Um, that's life, right? We have to have opportunity. But how many of you, like me, have shelves full of books with titles like failure-free activities? Right? How many of you, like me, were taught that you can never challenge an elder? Don't ever give them a, a stressful task. Don't engage them in decision-making because it's too difficult. You don't want to stress them out, right? We've all been taught <laughs> in the same paradigm, and, um, and now elders who are living with dementia are challenging that paradigm and really encouraging us to start viewing dementia um, from more of a social and relational view. And so that table is on there. I just briefly want to share um, my uh, doctoral supervisor, Sherry Dupuy, at the University of Waterloo, um, did um, research looking at the consequences of the biomedical view. And j again, this already came out in your comments, um, and so I don't want to be redundant, but just for us to remember that that biomedical view, it really changes everything. It, it shapes the way that people and their actions are judged. Uh, it, it really impacts how people are then treated. Um, and then they get labeled and stigmatized. So if I'm a person who's not living with dementia and I love to walk, uh, and, and that's great, but as soon as I'm living with dementia and I like to walk, somehow my action is judged as wandering. I'm labeled as a wanderer, and then, um, which by the way, would be a very stigmatized label. Um, and then the opportunities for me to walk are limited, right? So we, we, this, this, these are consequences of the view. So it limits choice and opportunities. It also fails to recognize contributions people who are living with dementia can make in their own lives and in the lives of others. Um, I love this morning um, our opportunity to reflect on how elders are our teachers. Even elders who don't speak are our teachers. However we walk into a relationship, whatever assumptions that we carry with us, it changes the opportunities for other people to contribute in that relationship. So it's really important that we walk into relationship with everyone with the understanding that, that we're all contributors, right? We're all contributors. Um, people feel ignored, silenced. We heard this in the quotes, completely disenfranchised. And then this is so sad. It does view how people who are living with dementia view themselves as they can internalize this tragedy discourse. And so we really need to, <laughs> to, to move upstream and that leads me to, um, actually, before I do that, um, I'm sorry, Kyrie, I had asked if you would share something. <laughs> do you remember there was one quote in there that sounded like poetry? That, can, can you tell us a little bit more about that, Kyrie? Sure. Thank you. Sure, yeah. And so you'll notice there were a couple quotes in there that were um, from people who had been down their journey of dementia for a while. And the one was the one that sounded like poetry. And that came from a woman that I'll call Sally, who I had the pleasure of spending quite a bit of time with. And I was working... Um, in San Francisco, and I was an intern in a psychology program. We were doing psychotherapy with elders. 
and I was down in the intern room and one of our new interns came running in and goes, I met Sally, talk about word salad. And my heart just like cringed. And I understood her excitement because she had been in school and had learned about, you know, what's clinically called expressive aphasia and was excited to see it in action. And rather than yell at her, because we're wearing these more love shirts because we love and community are behind any revolution. So I just like nodded my head and I went upstairs and I talked to Sally and I told her what had happened and how sad that it had made me because I saw the way that she spoke. I thought she sounded like Gertrude Stein, honestly. You know, she spoke through poetry and it was full of meaning. And when I hear word salad, I hear no meaning, just sounds. So I asked Sally if I could record some of her words to show the other interns that they are deeply infused with meaning. Um, and so we sat down and line by line, she spoke to me and I wrote it down and checked with her and that's what you guys heard today. And I'm so honored to be able to bring her words and continue to share them. I think her message was pretty clear, especially at the end of like, you could put me up with the regulars, I'd be okay. I don't think there's anything unclear about that. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Curie. Um, could you please uh, join me in thanking Curie for coming up and sharing with us? So uh, Curie and I, I have a, it's such a, an honor and a, and a pleasure. Uh, we are co-facilitators of Disrupt Dementia, which is a part of the Age of Disruption Tour, Bill Thomas's Age of Disruption Tour. And so we have a workshop, and I, I don't really know if workshop is the proper term. I don't think it's the proper term. I'm not sure what to call it. It's an experience called Disrupt Dementia. And, um, and, and we use those quotes as a part of that experience. And so thanks to Curie for being being here and, uh, and helping me with that part of the session. So one of the things that I heard in the quotes, actually it's a great quote in there from Christine Bryden. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever read Christine's book, Dancing with Dementia, My Story of Living Positively with Dementia, but it's a fabulous book. And that's where that quote came from, where she's calling for care partnerships. And she said, stop, it can't be caregiver. We need to be care partners. And, and language um, is so important, um, and, and, but actions are equally important. So it's not just about using the right terminology, it's about actually using the correct approach. Um, and people who are living with dementia want us to be partners. And that is the next pathway. How do we move from making decisions for people who are living with dementia to actively engaging them as partners in decision making? And there is a handout um, on authentic partnerships. Was it, it, it's an approach I want to share with you briefly and then have a discussion about partnerships because we've all experienced partnerships. Some have been more successful than others, right? We all know what it's like to have someone say we're in a partnership, but really it's tokenism, right? Has everyone experienced tokenism? Sometimes just by virtue of being a woman in the world, uh, sitting down at a table, sometimes with men, I have definitely experienced tokenism before in my life. Fortunately, that was much earlier in life. I don't feel it so much today. Um, but I think nobody likes tokenism. People who are living with dementia do not like tokenism. If we're going to invite them to the table, we have to support their involvement, their authentic participation as decision makers. And so when I was at the University of Waterloo, um, I uh, um, was working as a research assistant for the Murray Alzheimer Research and Education Program. And they have a, a um, strong commitment um, to only working in partnership with people living with dementia. In fact, they have produced a series of amazing guides called By Us, For Us Guides that are all available for free download online. And these guides were all written in partnership with people who are living with dementia. So that's their general approach, nothing about us without us. And Merit does a really good job of working in partnership with people who are living with dementia, but they didn't always. <laughs> and so Merit, and uh, it's director Sherry Dupuy at the time. We all have a, our five-year plan of forgiveness, and we are all called to critically reflect on our approaches from time to time, and these are opportunities. And so Merit was planning a, we'll call it a by us, for us conference, for people living with dementia, by people living with dementia, and it was gonna be held in Toronto. And Merit invited people living with dementia to the table to help plan this conference. And 
you know, sometimes people living with dementia were sharing ideas that didn't really jive with the ideas of the academics and professionals at the table. And the folks at Mayrip didn't listen very well. And uh, they didn't work in partnership as, as well as they could have. And came time to register for the conference, and nobody came. No one came. They had to cancel the whole conference. Such a shame. No one came. And so Sherry, to her credit <laughs> for being such a critically reflective person, um, she said, what did we do wrong? And they said, you didn't really partner with us. You invited us to the table, but it felt like tokenism. And Sherry is an amazing person. She was well-intended, just like <laughs> that quote said. People with the best of intentions sometimes fall short. And so Sherry said, how can we do better? What can we learn from this experience about how we can partner with you in what we'll call an authentic partnership? So we embarked on a two-year study in partnership with people living with dementia, so they were our research partners, to better understand and articulate what it means to be in an authentic partnership with people who are living with dementia. And that we do have to be thoughtful about what enables a partnership to flourish. And so that's your handout there. Um, it's called PIDC at the top of the page. That's Partnerships in Dementia Care Alliance. They have a great website. This is a resource. Um, so after two years of working in partnership with people living with dementia, we developed this model. And the model is meant to help us critically reflect. And so they developed some reflection questions. So when you're sitting at the table with people who are living with dementia in a partnership, we have an opportunity to really reflect on the things that can either make it or break it. And that's the outside circle, these five enablers of authentic partnerships. And they're in your handout. The inner circle there, those are the principles of authentic partnerships. So those are the things we all commit to, that we all believe in these principles. Um, and one of my favorite principles is focus on the process. And that's a hard one. Don't focus on what you're trying to achieve in the partnership. Don't focus on the outcome, because then what my partners living with dementia said, we get so focused on the result that we don't really <laughs> reflect on the process, which are those enablers. So take the time to reflect on how this partnership is going, and we will achieve a better outcome. And I believe it, and I've seen it. And I've seen it time and time again through the work at Mayrip. They focus on the process. They engage in authentic partnerships. And, um, and so these are the enablers creating a safe space, you know, what makes people feel comfortable, um, valuing diverse perspectives, and there's some great reflection questions about what are we going to do as a group of people who are coming together and share decision making when we know that we're not all going to agree? How are we going to demonstrate that we value everyone's perspectives? We're going to have um, open communication and this understanding that communication makes, takes many different forms. And so if we're going to have open communication, what does communication look like? Effective communication within the context of cognitive changes and to be very thoughtful about it. We need to have regular uh, reflection and dialogue about how the partnership's going. That helps us focus on the process. Connect and commit to each other. And those are the, the principles. And you'll see in your handout there's some prompts to help guide us in our thinking about it. This model has been so helpful to me in my continued work with people who are living with dementia to help me engage in authentic partnerships and not slip into tokenism. And it's really easy to do. It is very easy. So that's why I try to keep this kind of front and center in my thinking. But it's pretty intuitive, right? We've all had partnerships. Some of those partnerships have been very successful, and some maybe not so successful. And so right now, I'm just going to ask, this is called a think-pair-share activity. So I'm going to ask each person to find just one partner and to reflect on the strongest, most authentic partnership you have ever experienced, and then reflect on which of these principles and enablers were present and supported. Um, are there any additional principles and enablers that were present and supported that aren't in that model? Or does this model um, pretty much capture the essence of an authentic partnership? And we'll just take three minutes for that discussion, OK? Don't be afraid to get up and move if you need to find a, a partner. I'm going to ask, um, how does this framework work for you? Does it? Do you feel that this is a helpful way to think about how we support and enable partnerships? 
It's pretty, I have found, and this is the wisdom of the elders, I, you know. <laughs> Um, they are the best research partners in the world, um, and um, and I have found this work incredibly helpful in my career. I've used this framework of reflection to think about how I work with people at the point of care, as well as how I work with people to um, mobilize organizational change, as well as how I do my own research that I use the same framework and I use those same reflection questions across all different types of settings and situations. And personally, I find that they're really helpful. <laughs> they're really helpful. If anyone, um, if you want, I'd be happy to email you the full article. It was published in the uh, International Journal of Dementia. And in that article, is a table that has all of those great reflection questions, the long version of it. And my partners who are living with dementia just encouraged us to please th you know, give it a little more thought, that it does take critical reflection, that if we just go about things with good intentions, sometimes it's not enough. And that's why they helped us develop the reflection questions. And so if, if anyone wants that article, feel free to give me your email, and I'm happy to send it to you. I'm curious, any, any enablers that you feel are missing from the framework that would be helpful for us to reflect upon um, as we move forward in partnerships? Anything that you want to add to those set, that set of enablers? Yeah. I, I wonder if it's OK if I can add a more general observation that I've had and looking at this I I joked with Chris originally and maybe this isn't this is actually quite serious that you know when looking at this I said wow this is this is yeah authentic partnerships and I question how many authentic partnerships I'm truly achieving on this level of depth and and uh, my wife's not in the room but I, I think I, th I think we actually make it that's the one that I think we're doing really well on um, however uh, the more general statement that I have is, you know, I, this makes sense to me from an uh, emotional level and an intellectual level in a dyadic relationship, but I struggle with the extension of this to a, a, a more convoy approach, more, uh, I mean, we don't just have dyadic relationships, it's a matter of multiple people, you mentioned families, others mentioned teams, but in, in the process of life, we have a lot of different relationships, and often those relationships intersect and are tied together. And how how do you take this model and extend it to a, a broader uh, community of people or convoy of people? I'm so glad you said that. I'm going to give a practice example of that toward the end of the session, how we actually used authentic partnerships to promote well-being on an organizational level, engaging elders living with dementia, family care partners, and um, professional care partners. And, and, and the, it, it, it is a very um, thoughtful, I want a kind of a, a systematic type of approach that actually um, where, where we have conversations up front to negotiate these things. Um, as a group. And so, for instance, when we talk about creating a safe space, we actually have a, a, a meeting, if you, if you will, to do nothing but talk about how we create a safe space. How are we as a group of people going to create a, set, a, a, a safe space together? And we actually develop safe space guidelines that, be, that guide our, our group in working in partnership. We even negotiate things like valuing diverse perspectives. When you have a, a group of two people, it's, you know, we, when you have a group of 12 people or 60 people, how are we going to value diverse perspectives? So we have those conversations in advance. We negotiate the process in advance. And we keep that direction that we have co-created up front and present as we continue in our work together. And same thing with communication and connecting and committing, that for each one of these enablers, drawing on those reflection questions, Questions. These are conversations that we have, formal conversations that we have, and we actually take notes and create some formal guidance to help a group move forward. So um, I, I think it's, um, for me, it's been a really, um, <laughs> I'm so glad you said it's been a really effective framework for me, not to just think about my relationships and partnerships with people who are living with dementia, but any partnership that I'm having, any partnership I think can be um, benefited through some critical reflection about what's working and what's not working and how, how do we create stronger support. 
Um, is there any, any other discussion before I move to the next uh, pathway? Yeah, let me bring this over to you. I think any great partnership also um, requires simple social graces that you've got to stop. Don't get so task-oriented that you forget to say, do you want to? Please? Thank you. And don't get wrapped up in the task to the point that you forget to see if they really initiated it. Yes. That, that we get to moving forward and we don't stop. And we, would, and we would, in any other situation, we would stop and ask, Charlotte, do you want a cup of coffee? And she'd say, please. I mean, we, we slow down on the task. We are too task-oriented. You can't have a partnership if one of you is the arrow moving forward and the other person never gets the chance to engage. Thank you for that. I think that my partners really agreed with that, too, and that's why they didn't just put focus on the process in, as a principle. They also made it an enabler because they really want for us to reflect and on how things are going and, and are we sure that we're hearing what we're hearing and are we really ready to move forward? So it's really about the process of working together, not the outcome of working together. So uh, my partners have offered this, they offered this to Mayrup um, as a way that we could partner better and, um, and we're offering it to you as a possible way that um, we can, a pathway toward um, getting upstream toward well-being because we can't get upstream and promote well-being without partnering with people who are living with dementia. We can't come up with the thing that is gonna support the well-being of elders. We have to work in partnership with elders. And, um, and so that's why we thought we'd start with this one. <laughs> it's kinda, this is the foundation to get us upstream is that it's not, it's not up to us to come up with what will be meaningful or purposeful in supporting someone's well-being. We have to work in partnership with the elders. And it's like the quote we were expanding on, uh, you know, that you were talking about, you can't do your job without me. You don't know how to be focused on my needs unless you ask what my needs are. We're going to talk a little bit about Pathway 3 and then um, just a few words and then we'll take a uh, quick break. Uh, just to give you a chance to stretch and everything. Um, we were talking about poetry, though, so I have to, and, and this kind of reminds me also of what Cherry Joe was saying. I, I want to share a quick poem, too, that I put in my second book. Um, this is more, more the five-year forgiveness plan. This is sort of a 20-year forgiveness plan because this happened a little over 20 years ago early in my nursing home career, but uh, it really caught me up short and taught me a lesson about low expectations of people. And um, this is uh, a woman whose name was Alberta, and uh, it's Alberta like the province Alberta. Her, she was born in coal mining country in West Virginia. Her father was a coal miner. Her husband was a coal miner. If she'd been born a boy, she would have been a coal miner too, probably. Her parents always loved the name Alberta, but none of them had gone to school. And so her name was spelled E-L-B-I-R-D-A, like a Spanish bird, Alberta. That's how they spelled it. So she was, she was not really highly educated herself, and so you just got this impression of her. She had some mild cognitive changes, and um, one day I came to see her for a routine visit, and she was writing, and I asked her what she was writing, and she said, oh, I like to write poems. And I said, oh, that's really great, and I, I just cringed to think of how patronizingly I probably said that 20 years ago. Oh, you write poetry, how nice, you know. So I asked her to show me the poem she was writing, and when she showed it to me, I wrote it down and put it in my book. This was her poem. Ecstasy is the lilting cadence of a song, lingering after the music ends. The sigh of utter bliss, content when love too overlong held back is finally spent. <laughs> so I was speechless. And once again, that just shows that when people have the opportunity to grow, they can express themselves in, in incredible ways. Um, so we are moving upstream. And as many of you know, I, I've written two books about dementia. The first one's called Dementia Beyond Drugs. The second one's called Dementia Beyond Disease. And it's occurred to me, um, because they both represent evolution. Um, Dementia Beyond Drugs was my first foray into challenging antipsychotics and trying to think of, thank you, more, um, more holistic ways of seeing people. Um, and I'm now revising that for a second edition, which will be out uh, at the end of the summer. But it occurs to me in moving from dementia beyond drugs to dementia beyond disease 
that I kind of moved from downstream to upstream. <laughs> Dementia Beyond Drugs talked about the problems. It talked about culture change. It has a lot of value. Uh, but when I talk about how to um, address people, communicate, understand distress, it's mostly what do you do when you see this? What do you do when you see that? So what I decided to do for the second book without even realizing I was doing it was I was, you know, Mary outside. My publisher was after me to write another book. And so I'd been working with this um, white paper that some Eden folks wrote about the Eden domains of well-being. Uh, they weren't called the Eden domains back then. But um, I thought, you know, I really like this. And I mentioned it briefly in the first book but never did anything with it. So I said, well, wouldn't it be a nice little addendum to my first book if I just took those seven domains, which I happen to like, I like that particular well-being model, and I could look at them through the lens of dementia, how they're challenged, how we can improve them, how we can use culture change. And I said, this will be a nice little supplement to my first book. And it turned out to be about you know, 30 pages longer than my first book because it opened up a whole world that I didn't see because it moved me upstream. So to me, it was really an appreciative approach to dementia, which I hadn't quite gotten. And, you know, appreciative inquiry was one of those things that Jennifer's taught me about, that you never quite have the trust that when you don't focus on the problems, they're going to go away. But what I realized is when you focus on well-being, people's distress goes away. And so I realized this really is appreciative inquiry being applied to uh, dementia. So we're going to do a quick large group activity just to get us up and moving. And I'm going to give you a couple slides before we break. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, break approximately into two groups standing in a circle. So let's have a group go toward Jennifer and a group go toward me. Come on, self-select. Keep them about even. Come on, move. You can do it. Ah, here we go. We are going to talk about the idea of ikigai. Ikigai is a Japanese concept, which basically is a reason to get up in the morning. And I love this uh, diagram Jennifer found because she sees it as the intersection of four things in our lives. That which you love, that which you're good at, that which the world needs, and that which you can be paid for. <laughs> <laughs> but we can take Ikigai farther, and we don't have to talk about what you're being paid for. What are just some of the reasons why you get up in the morning? So come on, and we can make a rough circle here, if you could. Make a rough circle. And what we want someone to do is, and we'll each do it in our separate groups, we want a volunteer to uh, step into the center of the circle and give us one of the reasons why you like to get up in the morning. And if there's anyone else in the circle that agrees with that, join them in the center. And then come on back out, and one other person will go in there. And we'll do that till we get a lot of people to give this. Now, make it harder. Yeah, yeah. So, um, we'll start with the volunteers. Then the first person up to join them is the one that goes next. The one that goes next. Okay. So each person can only be the person in the center once. So it's kind of, so that, that way you get to hear about everyone's story. Everybody's 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 uh, what the work we do. So go deeper. Find some other things that give you a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, let's just try this for a few minutes. It's because it gets beyond the traditional medical definitions of quality of life or quality of care, which very much are medicalized. They're important. There's no reason why we shouldn't measure those and value those. But you could live in a home where you always get your medications on time, you never fall, you never have a catheter or a pressure sore, and you can still hate your life and wish you were dead. Because there are a lot of other things that are missing when you just take care of the body. So um, I, I just want to uh, throw one other challenge out there at this point, too. And this is upstream, downstream as well. This is probably the most challenging thing I write in my second book, which is why non-pharmacological interventions don't work. And um, if you read uh, the geriatric journal, JAGS, recently, you probably saw a very provocative study that looked at studies of non-pharmacologic interventions and didn't find a lot of evidence that they were helping people with dementia. And a lot of people are using that as an excuse to give people drugs or to say, see, what you're doing doesn't work. The problem is not that we should avoid drugs. The problem that we shouldn't, that we should be avoiding drugs. The problem is the paradigm. The problem is the research paradigm that says uh, when somebody has uh, distress, we should have them full washcloths, or we should give them a hand massage. That might help for the moment, just like a pill might help for the moment, calm somebody. But if there's something bigger missing upstream, then all we're doing is reacting and calming people for the moment. And just like a pill, we're going to find it's going to wear off after a period of time. It took me a while to figure this out, but the time I really got it, I was speaking for the Alzheimer's Association in eastern Iowa, which is a very rural part of the US, lots of farms and fields. and and there was a gentleman who uh, I heard about who lived in an assisted living home. And 
very forgetful, and almost immediately upon moving in, he would, whenever he was in the lounge in the back of the building, he would try to go out the back door into the backyard. And the staff, you know, not wanting him to go out unsupervised, would keep redirecting him. And they tried engaging him in all kinds of interventions, whether it be listening to music or, or a hand massage or uh, something on the television. But the more they did that, the more insistent he became. So finally, after a few days of struggling with this gentleman, who couldn't really talk or express himself uh, the way he used to, their manager said, listen, we have a fence around the yard. It's a nice day. Why don't you stand back and let him go once and just see if you can figure out why he wants to go outside. What's he trying to do? So they uh, stood back, and he went outside and walked to the back fence. And behind them, there was a pasture with a herd of cows. And he stood there at the fence and watched the cows for about 15 minutes. And then he turned around and just walked back in. And he was calm and happy all day. Well, they had their initial care plan with his family. And they mentioned what had happened. And his family said, well, he's been a farmer for 60 years. He started every day of his life by going outside and checking on his cows. So um, I tell this not just because it's a clever way to figure out what this gentleman's need was, but to think about what do we do when someone is trying to exit the building? We try a hand massage, or we try folding laundry, or we try music. But what if they want to check the cows? <laughs> None of those things is ever really going to help, is it? Because we don't know the person in the historical context, the relational context. We're just applying this laundry list of interventions, which sometimes includes laundry, of things we think might work, when really they have no meaning for the individual. And that's what most of our research does. So I'm a researcher. I think lemon balm aromatherapy is very calming. So I come into a nursing home, and I randomize 40 people. And I give them my intervention, aromatherapy, at my time of day. And if they're looking for cows, then the lemon balm is not going to help them. And so we need to get out of this paradigm of trying to measure a non-medical approach in, with medical research methodology. And that's the problem, is that the researchers have not broken out of the medical uh, box. We even treat this like doses of pills, you know, pet a cat, QD, right? Or uh, have a hand massage, TID after meals, like it's a pill. But if it's superimposed on the usual environment, it doesn't really change anything. So let's move to well-being. And this is the view that I've been using to teach from, and it's not the only view. What's more important than these seven words, I think, if you have a different model, is how you apply them. So if you, you know, read what we do, and you have your own model if you use the census framework or you use some other model of well-being, that's OK. If it's a good model and you use it the way we use ours, then you're probably going to have equal success. So this is upstream, because I've come to believe, with my appreciative approach, that most of the distress we see that we can't easily figure out is because one or more of these domains of well-being has been eroded. And instead of just trying to, quote, fix the behavior, which is what we're taught to do, if we work behind the scenes to restore these domains of well-being, then while we're ignoring that distress, it will eventually go away because we went upstream and dealt with the real cause of the bodies floating down the river. Okay, And it's amazing how often this works. It's hard to do because it's counterintuitive. You've taught to respond to that person, to react to that person's distress and try to fix it. And I'm telling you to ignore it and work on well-being, an appreciative approach. Now, what I did with the original model, as you saw, is I rearranged the words a little bit and put them in a little different order. I like this hierarchy just because um, I think, now, once again, I'm not suggesting that some domains are more important than others. And I'm not suggesting that well-being only flows in one direction. If I do something meaningful, it could feed into my identity. But what I'm saying is if someone has had their well-being eroded, either through living with a condition like dementia, or through our care environment, which has eroded their well-being, and you want to help restore it, then there's a logical order. And I don't think you can bring a person well-being if you don't know them and have a relationship with them. So I put identity and connectedness on the bottom, because you can't bring well-being to a stranger nearly as well as you can a friend or someone with whom you have an important relationship. Once you know them and they have some familiarity with you, it builds trust. It builds a sense of peace and ease with you. Then people feel more secure. And when you're feeling secure and you know them and they know you, you can start to negotiate risk to help people be more autonomous. And it's only, as Jennifer said, when you can make those, take those risks and make choices that you can actually do something that's truly meaningful, not failure-free, meaningless activity, but truly meaningful. And that's what enables you to grow as a person. And all those can feed into joy, or joy can be a standalone domain as well. Um, now, Maslow, as you know, Maslow's hierarchy, puts security, puts safety on the bottom. 
But Maslow was talking about food and shelter. That's our most basic need. And that's part of security, but security, I think, is also emotional, spiritual security. So it's also trust, familiarity, dignity, uh, respect, balance. These are all aspects of security as well. So, and I feel that you can help a person be, feel more secure in all those dimensions if you know them well first. So I put it up on the second level. Just something for you to play around with and see what you think. Now, it's interesting because Mayrup, the group that does the Buy Us For Us guides that Jennifer talked about, worked on reforming uh, leisure experiences. And Jennifer was part of that research, along with Sherry Dupuy and others. And they're trying to get away from the idea of programmed activities that may be hollow to finding out what people really enjoy, what gives them true enjoyment and leisure. And they ask people, what is it that gives you joy? What is it that brings about important leisure experiences? What are the characteristics? And what they got from Merup was seven things. Being me, being able to be myself during that experience. Being with, as in with others, but it could be with the invisible too, like your God, or with a, a garden or a pet. Seeking freedom, finding balance, making a difference, growing and developing, and having fun. Do you want to say something about that? Oh, I just was going to sh share that this is um, another article. This is an example of an authentic partnership in research. Yeah. So oh, I'm sorry, two, they asked 200 people with Alzheimer's to answer this so question. 12, yeah. So we worked in partnership with a group of people who were living with dementia who were a part of the John Noble Home Lead Program, which, yeah. and they were our research partners. And um, together with the academic partners and some family and professional care partners, we all went out and surveyed or interviewed 219 people living with dementia across settings, brought all of that data back to the table, and my research partners who were living with dementia helped us make sense of all of that data in a two-year study, and this was the result of that study. And um, if I could just explain, it's interesting. I, we asked them how should we conceptualize of these beautiful themes. Um, is there a hierarchy to it, or what, what yeah, would they say? Yeah. And they said, no, we, we want to work with an artist <laughs> um, to help really capture the essence of our experience. And so we, we got a, an artist, Dr. Lisa Machino, and she worked with um, our research partners living with dementia to create this um, this conceptualization, and and they said this. They said that when you're diagnosed with dementia, it's like living. It's like being in the eye of a storm. Do you see the eye of the storm up there? And they said, but when we have opportunities to be connected to these meaningful experiences, which is different than saying when you give us activities. They said when we have opportunities to connect with these meaningful experiences, then we can live and celebrate life. And, um, and so that was why um, it has that beautiful swirl. Um, it, they said that then when you're living with dementia, your life can unfold into a rich tap tapestry of experiences. So that was why um, it, it looks like this. But another, it's an awesome, um, the awesome product of an authentic partnership. Thanks very much for sharing that. So Jennifer first presented this at Needham Conference four years ago in Grand Rapids. And uh, it was an, uh, a breakout session, and Nancy Fox and I were sitting in the front of the room, and Nancy was the lead author of the well-being paper that I've been telling you about. And when Jennifer showed this slide, Nancy and I looked at each other, and we said, holy cow, and realized that you can actually shift the order a little bit and line these up so beautifully with those domains of well-being. Um, and the reason I love this is because with all those domains of well-being, no matter what framework I talked about, or Tom Kibbutt or whoever, None of those were really developed with the input of people living with dementia. They've all been researchers' ideas of what is well-being, including our own, the Eden Domains. So I feel like this particular framework I'm using has had some validation by people living with dementia, that they've said, yes, just because we have a condition like Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia doesn't mean that those seven domains go away in our lives. If anything, you might, you might even think that things like autonomy and meaning become more important because they're so easily lost when people's abilities change and when society starts seeing them differently. So I just love the way this lined up and love the work that Merip has done because it's helped me see what we're going to do. Yes, Hope. Oh yeah, sure, absolutely, absolutely. Now, you know, the one that looks like it might not be 100% might be security and finding balance, but security is very much balance between too much and too little. Overstimulation, understimulation, uh, socialization, uh, solitude. There's so much emotional balance. 
Um, so I think that's a big part of it when you take security beyond physical safety and talk about this whole idea of emotional, spiritual security as well. Anybody need more time for that? You all good? And uh, there are handouts. If you didn't get one, uh, we have more. We have, yeah, we can share a PDF as well. So um, we're going to do another quick activity, and we're just going to take about uh, five minutes here. And we'd like you to, you got a, do you have a worksheet? Do they have a worksheet? Okay, your handout has a worksheet. We'd like you to, t to apply this well-being to yourself. Take uh, just a few minutes to write down how these seven domains apply to you and how they're fulfilled. And so on one page, you have the definitions. And uh, there are different levels. You can talk about your personal well-being. You can talk about your elder's well-being. You can talk about operational well-being. But there's some guiding questions, and we won't have time to answer all these. But look through a few of these. Pick a couple of your favorite domains and answer these for yourself. And you can also use the next page, which has seven glasses, to even uh, score yourself or score a favorite elder on these seven domains. Fill the glasses. Are the glasses 100%? Are they empty or are they somewhere in between? Each one. Does the person have 30% joy? Do they have 70% autonomy? Fill it out for yourself or someone you care for. This is a very interesting experiment. And this is something we do in my seminars to help us decode uh, distress as well. There's a great saying that I pulled off of that wonderful resource, Facebook, which says, but I use it all the time now, which is, people who wonder whether the glass is half empty or half full are missing the point. The glass is refillable. And that's what we're going to talk about is whatever level people are at now, we're going to fill it because you can do that. And that's the great thing about well-being. So let's just take a little time. Uh, let's just take a few minutes. Uh, yeah, and then, and then share with a partner. So let's just take about, we'll give you a cue after about three or four minutes of taking some notes to start talking to a partner, okay? I'd like to say one thing that gives them a sense of well-being that they thought of when they read through these definitions. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Well, I'm getting out of it. Just being here in this conference is giving me a lot of joy <laughs> because it's giving me a lot of knowledge, and I can take back to share with someone else, and that's going to make me happy as all our days. <laughs> <laughs> so you just talked about joy, meaning, growth, connectedness. Yes, it's all right there. The whole it's thing. All right there. I mean, just I enjoy and you know when we were when we were meeting with a group of people yesterday, someone said, you know, I have to come here every two years to get my glasses filled. Uh, yeah. yeah, get yeah. your glasses oh, filled. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Else? Somebody else want to talk about a sense of well-being? Where are your glasses brimming over? Yeah. Anyone? Whose glasses are full? Teresa, your glasses are always running over. Give us one. We were just talking about the different stages of growth where she's just got a new baby and I'm just got oh, a new apartment. And uh, and. Uh, She's like, well, I don't feel I'm growing as much. I said, I've grown more in the last two years than I have in 30 years. So it, it's, it, it doesn't stop. It never yeah, stops. Yeah, it doesn't stop. It never stops, yeah. It never stops. Beautiful. Yes. Did anyone reflect on the elders that they serve, how they're doing with regard to well-being? What do you think about that? Are any of those glasses levels Any of those low? glasses maybe not as good as they could be? Yes. I found I really struggle with autonomy and the elders uh -huh. Uh -huh. because that seems to be one of the highest needs for them and one of the areas of well-being that if they could just have liberty, they feel that everything would be fine. So I struggle to help them yeah. achieve that sense of liberty while maintaining a safe environment and meeting that need, especially if that need's unmet before they come to us yeah. um, to help achieve that sense of well-being. And it's Thanks. not something, it takes a long time to help to, for them to help feel that way. Absolutely. Um, you know, when I constructed that pyramid, uh, there, when you look at each level, identity connectedness, security, autonomy, meaning, and growth, there's a lot of connection between the two domains on each level. Mm -hmm. And the big connection with security and autonomy is you really need to have a sense of security and the person who c supports you needs to have a sense of security about you in order for you to be able to be more autonomous. The, the, but there's also a, a double-edged sword because the more we focus on physical security and safety, sometimes the more we erode autonomy and even quality of life or well-being. So it's a tricky balance and it's not that there's one answer. But what we tend to do in elder care is we default to the worst possible thing. 
And I likened it to a golfer. You know, if a golfer is going to hit the ball to the green, they'll test the wind and say, okay, the wind's coming out of the west. I'm going to hit the ball a little bit to the right, and the wind will blow back to the green. But what we do in long-term care it would be like saying, well, I remember back in 1987, we had a 50-mile-an-hour wind coming from over there. So every time I hit the ball, I'm going to hit it there because it might just blow the ball onto the green. That's what we do. We expect the worst thing that can happen, and we punish everybody so that one thing can't happen. So you can negotiate risk, and I talk about that in my writings. We won't go into that now, but we've had a couple questions about that. So come to one of the well-being talks tomorrow, and we'll talk about negotiating risk. But um, <laughs> do you find that it's a little harder to fill those glasses with the elders? Do you find maybe that you just didn't think about this for the elders? The biggest, um, the biggest revelation I get in my class is I have somebody bring in a real-life challenge at the end of the day, second day. And we talk about everything they've tried to do to support that person. And then we give people the seven glasses and ask them based on what they heard to see how full those glasses are. And it's rare for any one of those glasses to be more than 30% full, and they're usually just about empty. And so you can give people the revelation that they've done everything they've been taught to help this person, and yet here are seven areas of human need that are almost totally unfulfilled in our care environment. Not because we're bad people, it's just not on our radar. I want to ask you a brief question, Al. Um, through this process, and I've, I've of course read your books, um, a lot of what we do is collaborative effort to do the best we can to assess kind of where someone's at with the, the cups or buckets being full in these seven domains. However, in going through the process today, I find that a lot of my assessments were extraordinarily subjective and, and even probably would vary from today to tomorrow uh, based on a lot of different factors, as I'm sure you're aware, how can we as the outside observer really get an accurate reflection of what truly is their level of well-being? Yeah. Authentic partnership, lady? Yeah, I was going to say, I, <laughs> I don't just personally, and, and this um, might um, open up a, a bee's nest <laughs> for debate about observational methods and that put us in the seat, to, uh, not the seat, in the tower of expert peering down and judging others. Um, I, I, I believe that we have a moral obligation to always engage people directly in their assessment of well-being or ill-being. And that um, personally, I believe that, um, that it's important for us to move out of that role of expert believing that we can judge the well-being of another person and for us to engage in authentic partnership to the extent that that, that the partners are able um, so that they help us understand their own well-being. I'll just share a short story about that. We were doing the Eden Alternative Well-Being surveys um, at a community um, of people, um, elders who are living with dementia. And um, so we, we wanted to understand the well-being using these surveys. And um, it's really hard. There's um, really, um, other than dementia care mapping, there, you know, there's, it is challenging sometimes to, to get a sense of how people would um, judge their own well-being through things like survey measures. Um, but we, we thought we need to engage people in their direct assessment of their well-being to the extent that, that, that anyone is able. And so we had this well-being assessment. We gave it to an elder, um, well, to many elders and family care partners and employee care partners. We were all assessing well-being. And this one family care partner said to me when I gave the survey to his, his wife, he's like, oh, no, no, she, I'll do it for her. And I said, oh, I said, well, um, how about if I sit down and I will help her with it um, because she um, has challenges um, communicating verbally, and he just assumed that she wouldn't be able to accurately report on her own well-being, so he was going to put himself in the role of expert judger. <laughs> and so I said, well, let me sit down and, and, and help her with that. And I, we sat down, and the response categories were yes or no on the elder well-being survey. And I went through every single item with her. And I asked her whether or not she was having this experience, yes or no, for these various items. And she'd say, oh, mm-hmm, oh, mm mm-hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And her husband was listening as we went through every single item. She responded on her own well-being. 
And, and very, very, like she was clearly responding to the questions. And at the end of that, the day, her um, husband, we were asking, you know, how'd the retreat go? And what did people learn? What were their takeaways? And he stood up and he said, I learned that I need to ask my wife for her opinion much more often. And she went, yes, yes. And, and it was just like for him such an aha because he just assumed that because she has difficulties expressing herself that she wouldn't be able to report on her own experiences. And so to the, you know, and some people honestly couldn't respond to yes or no questions on the Eden Alternative Wellbeing Survey. That's a reality. But there's other creative things we could do. That communication part of authentic partnerships. There's a beautiful study where elders used art and they were asked to express their experiences using the medium of art. This was Christine Jonas Simpson and, um, and Gail Mitchell were the, the Canadian researchers doing this. And the elders were, were expressing their experiences using art and then sharing what they had painted or what they drew. Um, and, and, and it gave such tremendous insights into their experiences in ways that a quality of life or well-being survey m m might not even capture. So we got to be creative. And we just have to work really, really hard to give elders the opportunity to speak for themselves in all matters, including the assessment of their well-being. Sorry, that was a really That's long, right. short answer. And, and remember, remember also that people express choice in other ways besides words. So you can see somebody who's pushing you away as being difficult, or you can say they're expressing choice about this task. And if we're open to learning, because some studies like Dr. Cohen Mansfield have found that the majority of people who are resistive during care can be tied directly to how they were approached by the care partner. Doesn't mean we're bad people, but theoretically then if we could learn how to change our approach, be open to learning, then all that resistiveness could, could melt away. So people express autonomy in different ways, with embodied autonomy as well as verbal autonomy. Um, very quickly, and you have this on your handout, so I'm not going to belabor it, but these are some of the reasons to focus on well-being. I think we've just talked about this uh, in our discussion, so I'm not going to hold with that. Uh, and remember that we need to change the culture everywhere, not just in a nursing home, but assisted living in the community, in regulations, in reimbursement, and in education. And we've been trying to take you through a more experiential, dialogical approach to education. And uh, so I'm not, now going to turn it back over to Jennifer, who's going to really get into Pathway 4 and talk about how we changed an educational approach. We, I helped Jennifer. It's all her idea. <laughs> <laughs> There are no original ideas, actually, is what I've learned. I stole it all from Palo Freire. <laughs> there you go. So this is the next pathway, pathway number four. Um, to really, so we've had our pathway number one, focusing on, you know, viewing dementia through a social relational lens. Um, then pathway number two, working in partnership with people who are living with dementia instead of four on behalf of people living with dementia. And then the third one is focusing on well-being instead of interventions. And so sometimes in our field, this is what happens. We've learned those things, and then we come up with the best ways for us to promote well-being within our communities, right? And, and often that's the way that, that we're taught. Someone will tell us how. Here's all of the great programs that will promote well-being within your organization. And so they, they give us the template. And, um, but I think that there's a different approach to education um, that is more supportive of those other three values that we just talked about. Instead of doing traditional education, for us to move toward dialogue education, where uh, we are all teachers and we are all learners, which sounds a little bit like a partnership to me, right? And that in working in partnership, as teachers and learners together, we can better understand how to promote well-being given um, those domains of well-being as, um, as the basis for a conversation. And so think about this. Right now, <laughs> this is kind of a problem, not just within dementia care, it's kind of a challenge within the culture change movement itself, that a lot of our efforts are, are a lot of efforts to improve dementia care are reproducing the same paradigm, right? The top-down, expert-driven, um, interventionist, reactive, and, and, and think about this, how often do training initiatives and educational programs focus on teaching the latest and the greatest intervention? How many of you have gone to training programs like that where you go and you learn about this great non-pharmacological intervention? 
I've been to so many, <laughs> okay? But, and, um, and so that's reactive. And then this question, how often are they designed by the so-called experts? Who's designing the latest and greatest interventions? Are they people who are living with dementia? Nope. They are the so-called experts. And, 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 they're, and we're, so the so-called experts are teaching us stuff and we're implementing them from the top down, often transferring knowledge in a very one-size-fits-all manner. That is the current paradigm. That, that the culture change movement needs to actually shift education as well. We, we need to shift this paradigm that's perpetuating the culture we're trying to change. So we, we need to change the culture of education about dementia care as well. We need to change the culture of education about culture change as well. We need training initiatives and educational programs that include and offer meaningful roles to people who are living with dementia because they are the true experts and their care partners as everybody works together to expand the possibilities of living well with dementia. And that's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. How do we create educational opportunities for communities to engage in shared educational experiences where they work together to understand how they could better promote well-being? So before I talk a little bit more about dialogue education, I just want you to take a moment to yourself to think about the best learning experience of your life and to jot down a couple of words that speak about the qualities of that educational experience that you really liked. What were the qualities of your best educational experience ever? And if you just take a minute to jot a couple ideas down on paper. Does everybody have at least one word? Someone, anybody, do you need a little more time? So everyone has at least one word. Can we hear some of the words? What are the qualities of your best educational experiences? Collaboration, Collaboration participation, experiential, experiential. Yeah. challenging, ongoing. transformational, ongoing, ongoing, ongoing. ongoing. Meaningful. meaningful, stressful. <laughs> I like it. Trust. Inspiration. Supportive? Supportive. So hang on to these words. When we think about our best learning experiences, do, does your experience line up pretty well with this? This, this is um, the six factors of adult learning. So when we're talking about adult learning, this is what the researcher said. This is the type of environment that, that we need to try to create when we're teaching adults. And I think kids as well <laughs> would fit into this category. Respect, immediacy, that it's meaningful stuff. You could use it immediately, that people feel safe, supportive, um, that people are h highly engaged. They feel included. And here's what's interesting. Think about education. We only retain 20% of what we hear. If we see it and hear it, we can get towards 40%-ish. If we can see, hear, and do something with it, then we can actually retain 80%. Think about most of the educational experiences, whether they're dementia-related or culture change-related, that you have been a part of yourself. And kind of think about where, where are you in terms of you know, this retention factor. The way we teach makes a big difference. If we just stand up here and speak at you in a monologue or a lecture, and there were no slides, then you know 20% is pretty good of retention. If we add the slides, okay, now you can see it, you can hear it, 40, but that's only 40%. We can do better. Why create educational opportunities that are only going to you know get you at a 40% retention? People have to do something with it. They have to do something with it. And here's another reason. It's not just practicality that we need to engage people differently in education about culture change and dementia. This is a quote from Paulo Freire, who really, he was the founder of what we call radical education or dialogue education. He said, any situation 
in which some people prevent others from engaging in the process of inquiry or change is one of violence. It's violent not to include people. It is an act of violence not to engage people in the decisions that affect their lives. To alienate humans from their own decisions is to change them into objects. We're not called to implement culture change strategies to promote well-being. That is the current paradigm. Culture change calls for a different approach completely. One where we engage in authentic partnerships and inclusive experiences to help us decide together how to promote well-being. Like this, that leaders were not supposed to be the proprietors of revolutionary wisdom. Oh, look at me, the hero, coming to tell you the latest and greatest thing I just learned at the last four conferences I attended, and now we're going to implement it. But that leaders are called to practice co-intentional education. We are all teachers and learners, and I love this quote from Margaret Wheatley because I truly believe whatever the problem, community is the answer. If it sounds hard to promote well-being and you're trying to figure out how are we going to get upstream, community is the answer. Your community, by working in co-intentional education, can help you get upstream. I love this quote. <laughs> Leaders who do not act dialogically but insist on imposing their decisions do not organize the people, they manipulate them. They do not liberate, nor are they liberated, they oppress. I think about this in terms of benevolent paternalism, right? There's a lot of benevolent paternalism in the world where people are not acting dialogically, they're acting with the best of intentions, but they are imposing their vision of what would promote well-being. They are promoting their dream, their vision. It could be really beautiful. It could be the best vision in the world. But if you're not creating a shared vision in your community, then according to Paulo Freire, um, who, by the way, got himself kicked out of an entire country for his radical beliefs, um, you're really, mani it's, manipula it's manipulation, okay? So he, he, Paolo Freire laid the foundation for something called dialogue education, which is an educational approach that can help us not reproduce the very thing we're trying to change. So this table is in your handout, talks about the importance of having, instead of lectures and putting on the expert hat, it actually engages people in learning activities where they draw on their own experiences, right? And they engage with new content, apply it, and consider its application to context. So it's not about you trying to retain the things that are coming out of my mouth. It's about creating opportunities for you to actually work with it, right? And to make it your own, for us to co-create. Instead of monologue, it's dialogue. Instead of it being passive listening, people are actively engaged. Instead of me being accountable for your learning experience, we're all accountable to each other. We're all accountable because we are co-creating content. Everybody's knowledge counts in the room. It's not about delivering content. It's about developing it together. And instead of there being a low sense of ownership in learning, it shifts it all, very high ownership, and here's the catch, though. Um, traditional learning, tr traditional training, say, it, it requires little preparation for some. Um, you know, usually if I create a, a lecture, I can use that same lecture for 20 years, right? Not dialogue education. It takes a long time to prepare learning activities thoughtfully and, and well. Um, here, the other thing about dialogue education that is important to remember is that you can teach half as much in twice the time. It, half as much, we will get through half as much content developing it together, and it will take twice the amount of time. So this, you know, initially, this might not sound like a winning proposition that you, you know, want us to move away from traditional education to something that you know, we can only cover half the content is going to take twice the time. But remember, if you don't engage people as being teachers and learners in their own educational experiences, they're only gonna have a 40% retention anyway. So it's really, it, 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 it's really, you know, it takes so much longer, it's well worth the investment. So the next pathway we want to actually honor dialogue education and invite you to reflect on, um, actually I'll turn it over to you, Al, um, this next pathway, which is the importance of working in collaborative teams versus top-down silos. And then we're going to put these five pathways together and share a story with you about how one organization um, has walked this, this pathway. Yeah. 
Um, I want to make this activity really quick. We got just a little over 15 minutes, uh, maybe 20 minutes. Uh, so we want to start with the idea of a huddle. And huddles are something that we recommend people do as part of their culture change journey. It's kind of like the learning circle format, but it's a stand up that you can do right in the middle of a busy day where you just get together and you share information. It can be around a particular issue, or it can just be to start the day or to share some ideas. So uh, what we'd like you to do is just maybe by table, stand up and, and gather in a quick circle uh, with each other. So we're going to have a bunch of little huddles. Hmm? I don't know. Doesn't sound very, I mean, the battery's going test, test. Yeah, it's, I'm just not, it's getting weaker. OK, so uh, you've got your huddle groups. and. Um, I will just ask you one question we'd like you to share around the huddle, OK? Can you think of one place where working collaboratively as a team at your organization helped improve one domain of well-being for somebody, maybe one of the elders or somebody on the team? So one way in which you're working as a team, maybe across departments, across shifts, across the hierarchy, helped you to improve well-being. And can I just, for Tough anyone question. who's not done a learning circle, with it's um, our a huddle. It's a stand-up learning circle, essentially, where one person will volunteer to go first, and then it will either go to the right or to the left. And each person has an opportunity to speak, and there's no crosstalk. Um, so it goes. In, you can pass when it comes to you, and then when it comes all the way back around to that first volunteer who started, you have an opportunity to go back to the people who passed to see if they want to contribute anything, and um, and then only after everyone's had the opportunity to, to contribute their response do you then open it up for further discussion. Okay. okay. Great. Okay. Just take about three minutes and see what you can do. So the question is, what's a time when working as a team, collaborating, actually helped you improve one of those domains of well-being, whether it be autonomy, security? Um, it's a tricky question, but we decide that you're very advanced and you can do it. <laughs> Okay, let's wrap up our discussions and move back to our tables when you can. Okay, thanks. I apologize for giving you a question that required longer answers when we're short of time. Like we said, dialogical education is half the content and twice the time. Um, so how was it, how did it feel to do a huddle? Was it, how did it feel to have an opinion and have people listening to you? Getting your turn? It doesn't happen in every meeting, does it? In a lot of meetings, the talkers talk and the listeners listen and, um, a lot of opinions don't get heard. And then you have the meeting after the meeting, you know, where I go to Jennifer and I say, oh my God, did you hear what Purcell said? What an idiot, I can't believe it. <laughs> because nobody had a chance to share their ideas because everybody wasn't heard. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk about how this was brought to life in one organization. We're gonna use our remaining time just to talk quickly about that and hopefully leave a couple uh, minutes for comments and we're going to, uh, we're going to honor the sanctity of the lunch hour, so we'll, we'll get through it. So <laughs> take it away, Jennifer. All right. So five pathways, right? I want to share a story about how one organization walked these pathways. Uh, they put it together into a project they called the Dialogue Project, appropriately titled. And this was a project at the Alzheimer's Resource Center um, of Connecticut. And they are um, a segregated <laughs> dementia care community. Um, they offer skilled nursing, assisted living, adult day, and also community-based services. And um, they read Al's book and were really excited about the promotion of well-being. Um, knew that they wanted to do a better job at the Resource Center in promoting well-being and getting upstream and, and getting out of that downstream reactive interventionist type of thinking. And so they partnered with Al and I on this project called the Dialogue Project to try to bring um, well-being together with these other values for partnerships in dialogue education. And so this is a one-year journey, and it was a, it's a process for transformative education, community conversations, and collaborative action. And these were their goals, that they wanted to expand possibilities for living well and nurture relationships, collaboration, and teamwork on the neighborhood, because it's really hard to support well-being without those, as you probably heard in your huddles, that working as a team is what really enables us to work most effectively to support well-being and to strengthen connection, communication, and trust, and then to identify, co-create, and work toward future organizational improvements. So if anything in the culture was going to change, it wasn't going to be because the CEO deemed it so or because you know the director of nursing heard about something great at a conference, but because 
they were going to they were going to co-create any improvements as an entire community of people. And so this is the the cycles of the process. You have this in your handout. It actually is a narrative description for you of their project for um, that lasted over a year. And um, the first thing they did was they convened an advisory team. And um, which of our which of our pathways does that honor? To have an advisory team help guiding the process instead of an individual. What do you think? Which pathway does that sound like? How about partnership, right? Doing things with instead of doing things for people, right? So an advisory team was really essential that if we were gonna create this project, it was gonna be guided not by one person, not by two or three people, but by an advisory team that was comprised of diverse community members, okay? So we had an advisory team. The advisory team really created the content for this process. And so um, we wanted to work on well-being. Well-being is a really big concept. How do you as an organization engage everyone in the community to promote well-being when there are seven domains? That's a tall order. <laughs> so we, ch we took a, 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 a one bite at a time. Um, oh, here is a picture of the advisory team meeting. And, um, and so you can see we divided this journey into five bite-sized chunks. And we brought uh, Al up to come and do five presentations with us. And these are kind of formal, traditional presentations because we did find that people really do like having that opportunity for more traditional education as well. And Al would come and do a 90-minute talk. First, he did an overview. And then the next time he came, he did a talk about identity and connectedness. Then the next time he came back, security and autonomy. And then he did meaning, growth, and joy as the three together. And then the fifth time he came back, he put it all together into his experiential pathway, experiential, I'm going to say it wrong, pathway for well-being. Okay, and, um, and, and so trying to, to and once we learned about the domains, to actually put it all together in a comprehensive package. But after each one of these presentations, it's a 90 minute presentation, not always the best way to um, you know, help people actually do something with knowledge. So for each of the presentations that Al gave, we had a corresponding neighborhood retreat. That neighborhood retreat lasted four and a half hours and it was based on the principles of appreciative inquiry, where we used a strengths-based approach to understand what was currently happening on each neighborhood that was supporting the domain that Al had just been talking about during his presentation. So AI um, is actually a form of action research. And um, action research um, is uh, really the principles of dialogue education are very much embedded in action research. Um, so it gave us a very dialogical educational approach of engagement that was also strengths-based. So we used AI to understand great things that were already happening within the organization that were promoting the well-being domains. Even if those great things only happened once in a year, <laughs> we were, it, 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 what it meant to us is that it was possible, right? And the idea is to build on an organization's strengths with the promotion of well-being because that really feels more aligned with that social relational model instead of being aligned with a biomedical model that might point out all the deficits and flaws and problems. So we focused on strengths. We had these four and a half hour retreats where elders, family care partners, and employee care partners all got together for four and a half hours so that they could explore the domains of well-being that we had learned about. Yeah, the, um, six, six six neighborhoods, and we had so there to do were six a, retreats for each of these visits. Oh, I'm sorry, there were five because we combined two. Five, so, four and a half hours. <laughs> and it was really hard to take the entire neighborhood away at once, so we divided in half. So for the first half of the day, half of the neighborhood would come, and then the other half of the day, the other half of the neighborhood would come. And so family care partners and elders had an opportunity to attend either. But what we know is that um, so here, oh, I have to show you this picture. Here's one of our elder storytellers. So as a part of the retreats, the elders would come in to be teachers, and they would share their stories about the domains of well-being. So the elders were our teachers and learners. They sat and learned alongside all of us. Um, and this was Lee. She was one of our storytellers. We were exploring the domains of security and autonomy. She was sharing a story about when she got the code for the door and how awesome that was. And she just tells us a great story. And she said, I just couldn't, I was so excited. I could open up the place. I was really excited. 
Um, but really, she told before that this powerful story about how she had lived there for five years in skilled nursing. And out her window, there was this place called um, Sliders. Sliders, this bar and grill called Sliders. And she said, for five years, this is about, she says, for five years, I watched people go from here across the street to Sliders for a burger and a beer. For five years, I watched you out my window. And I've always wondered what it was like inside Sliders. For five years. I watched you go there. And it's like, oh my gosh, the story was powerful. So they made a plan, she got the code, and she got to go to the sliders. And she, she went so. <laughs> and it made her day, made her year. So at these retreats, what we really did, we used AI to help us identify opportunity areas for growth on the neighborhoods related to well being. What we also know is that not all elders did more really wanted to go to a 90-minute presentation. They didn't, all elders didn't want to go to a four and a half hour retreat, right? And that for some elders, the best way to engage them in this process of exploring the domains of well-being was through a neighborhood huddle. So every neighborhood on every shift had a well-being huddle. And they discussed the opportunity areas that had been identified at those collaborative neighborhood retreats. So this was an opportunity to deepen our conversations about what we might possibly want to do as a neighborhood to create change and to engage elders who didn't come to the presentation and they didn't come to the four and a half hour retreat. Three times a day for five to 10 minutes, we continue talking about the particular domains of well-being. And then from all of those conversations, that data had to go somewhere. And so you'll see here, we identified opportunity areas, and now we've talked about them for a whole nother month, sometimes six weeks. So you can see one neighborhood said, these are the opportunity areas we identified. Now everyone on the neighborhood's gonna get a sticky dot, and they're gonna vote for the opportunity area that they want to work on first. What are people the most passionate about? So this is how the organization was working collaboratively to transform itself and to promote well-being. This is a very democratic process. So the whole neighborhood, elders, family care partners, employee care partners, everybody got a sticky dot. And then they would, they'd see very clearly that there was a neighborhood goal that had the most energy. And they would sit down at a neighborhood gathering and collaboratively develop their own action plan for how they would achieve that opportunity area or neighborhood goal. And so, um, so again, elders and family care partners were a part of the process alongside everyone else. And um, lots of opportunities for the neighborhoods to share their stories and to cross-pollinate ideas, um, to get a little competitive. These were just examples of some of the neighborhood goals for identity and connectedness. And you could see the range. One neighborhood wasn't ready for dedicated care partners because they didn't have, they, they just weren't there yet. So they, they opted for potluck gatherings so they could build relationships. That was the first step for them. And we had to trust in their wisdom that that was what they were ready for. They weren't ready to take a, a bigger step. They needed to build more of a relational foundation. So you could see the range here, but the wisdom of, of people knowing where they're at on their journey and knowing what would be best for them. And so we, over the course of 2015, the neighborhoods together developed 18 well-being goals, 18 neighborhood-specific well-being goals. And you want to talk about energy. The energy that went into working toward these goals was so great, it was so much greater than the energy that would have gone into any goal that the CEO came up with himself, right? Or herself, <laughs> right? So, so they had 18 well-being goals in 2015, and if you look in your handout, um, on the very back, you'll see the data from just one year, one year that this organization embarked on this very collaborative journey to promote the domains of well-being, and you see things like a 68% improvement in collaborative decision-making as neighborhood teams. So by the way, these are based on surveys that we did pre and post, um, and uh, there were um, I can't remember the exact number of responses, but I believe it was close to 200 responses. This, this was about 10 months' time. These 10 months. Happened. And then this is what the outcome 68% improvement in collaborative decision making as a neighborhood team, 63% improvement in elders' opportunities to access the outdoors, which definitely relates to domains of well being, 47% improvement in decision making with elders instead of for them. 
That's really amazing in just 10 months. A 41% improvement in working more flexibly to support elder choices. 47% improvement in supporting elders doing what they want, when they want. I mean, these are just tremendous outcomes. Um, all the way down to strengthening relationships, opportunities for people to reflect on their own well-being. These are just the highlights. I had to actually cut cut the <laughs> cut off the page somewhere. It's a huge page. It's a, the list continued on and on. They experienced so many tremendous outcomes by following these pathways and really committing to the journey as a community. So I want to leave you with that, um, just so that you had a, a sense of how uh, there's one possible structure that an organization came up with that would help them to work toward these pathways towards um, living upstream and the promotion of well-being. Yeah. So thanks, I have a code for you for CEUs. It's 1096. 1096 if you're getting CEUs. Thanks. Um, sorry, we've kind of run up to the end, but we want to get you out for lunch. If you have questions, come on up. Thanks again for all your participation. <laughs>